Hello, everyone. My name is D2 Kasui, and I'd like to welcome you to the very special session with Urban Financial Services Coalition, the Richmond chapter, in partnership with Investors 2000s Plus. We are celebrating Financial Literacy Month. Can we get a hand clap for Financial Literacy Month? You can either uh, clap in person, or you can do your virtual reactions. Thank you, Karen, for your virtual. Erica, thank you for your virtual uh, hand clap. Roderick, thank you. Uh, Janae Roscoe, thank you for the hearts. Monica, thank you for the hearts. Yes, we are celebrating Financial Literacy Month, and we're talking about closing the wealth gap. We're talking about closing the wealth gap. So, but before we close, start the wealth gap, close the wealth gap, start working on the, um, the wealth gap and start talking about housing, I would invite everyone to go ahead and share your name and the city that you're participating from in the chat. And if you have your LinkedIn profile, a link to your LinkedIn profile, go ahead and put that in the chat so that you can see who you'll be having an opportunity to network with. And so Urban Financial Services Coalition and Investors 2000, when we have these events, we like to always start with an icebreaker. And so we are going to do something which something that we call mingle, mingle, mingle. <clears throat> so if we were in person, you would love this exercise, but we are unable to do it in per person, but we're going to do it virtually. We're going to do a little mingling, have uh, have everyone to participate in this particular exercise. And I am going to bring this up. So the part of Mingle Mingle is that we're going to start with everyone sharing in the chat one word that describes how you are currently feeling today. One word that describes how you are feeling. Go ahead and throw that in the chat. Don't be afraid to <laughs> share in the chat. And I see that our friend Joe has, has put um, her feeling in the chat, said that she's doing great, that she's doing wonderful. All right, that's awesome. Um, Erica says that she's busy. Tammy says that she's doing wonderful. Tiffany says she's doing outstanding. And Dr. Sombo said that is happy. And Terry said that the blessed and Marlon said that he is excited. So keep that going. Keep that going. All right. We're ready for our second mingle mingle question. And our second mingle mingle question is <clears throat> share how someone who loves and respects you share how they would describe you. Share how someone who loves and respects you, how they would describe you. Go ahead and throw that in the chat. Um, so we have somebody has a birthday? Who has a birthday today? Oh, Robin has a birthday? Who's the birthday person? Robin Pope Moss. Robin Pope, Robin, you didn't let Well, my wife would be mad with me if I started to sing, but happy birthday, Robin. <laughs> birthday. Thanks, D2, and thanks for the birthday wishes. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so we got some folks uh, sharing in the chat. Norma says she's dedicated. Kaya83 said caring and kind. Kelvin said driven. Terry said love, love and kind. Kendra said kind. Uh, Dr. Aisha Glover said kind and consistent. Wow, we have some really good people. Karen Glad said humble. Uh, Tammy said positive, energetic, and fun. Excellent, excellent. All right, and we are ready for our last mingle mingle question. All right, and this question is share the best financial advice that you have ever received. 
and how you have leveraged that advice. Now, you're not going to share it in the chat. You're going to share it in your uh, breakout room. I'm going to give you uh, five minutes. That means everybody is only going to have a minute. So you have to do that to share the best advice you've ever received and how you leverage that best advice in the breakout room. And so please make sure that everyone has the opportunity to go. So the question is, share the best financial advice you've ever received and how you leveraged it. And you will only have one minute to share in your breakout rooms. Uh, make sure here that we have enough rooms. Oops. Not even a minute and a half. <laughs> <laughs> no, not even, not even a minute and a half. I, I know some of y'all, uh, you know, when you say one minute, <laughs> they are going to take full advantage of that um, <laughs> of that one minute. So they'll be they'll be pushing it uh, to the limit. Um, so please, 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 um, you got five minutes uh, to share, and please make sure that every one person per one minute per person. Please make sure that everyone gets the opportunity. So please click on the link, join your room, and we'll meet you back here on the other side. All right, all right. I, don't shoot me. I know some of you are saying that you didn't have enough time. I, I know that, you, but that's why we are putting those links, <laughs> you know, asking folks to put their links so that they can connect uh, with folks. And we have um, just about 30 seconds. Um, Marlon, um, I'm glad you enjoyed. Did you enjoy the networking time? Yes, sir, I did. All right. Um, Tiffany, uh, Tiffany and Lamar. Tiffany, do you mind sharing one of uh, sharing with us one of the best financial advice that you ever received? Um, it's Lamar. Uh, yeah, it's um, I, I'd say working for self and um, compounding my money. I trade, so I'll be compounding my money. It's probably one of the things I wish I had when I was younger. <laughs> ab ab absolutely, absolutely. Compounding interest is amazing and wonderful. <laughs> amazing and wonderful. Welcome back, everyone. Um, hopefully you had a really great time in the breakout rooms and you got a chance to do a little networking. And so we don't have a chance to have all of you share your, your best financial advice, but go ahead and throw it in the chat. Throw it in the chat. And while you're throwing it in the chat, I am going to bring up uh, one of my really good friends, a, a woman that is just amazing. And she is not only, when you, when you think about this woman, you know, you say, wow, she is beautiful. She's talented and she's a doctor. Yes, she's a doctor. Ladies and gentlemen, I like to bring up to the stage to bring some opening remarks, Dr. Jackie Smith Mason. Everyone, let's give her a big round of applause as she shares on behalf of Investors 2000 Plus. Greetings, everyone. Thank you, D2, for the, <laughs> that wonderful introduction. Once again, good evening and welcome to Closing the Wealth Gap, Leveraging the Power of Home Ownership. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Smith Mason, and I'm a founding member of Investors 2000 Plus Investment Club, a co-sponsor of this evening's event. Investors 2000 Plus began in 1993 with a small group of individuals who realized their knowledge about the stock market was lacking. In our households, discussions about the importance of having life insurance were common, but discussions about the stock market as a wealth building strategy was non-existent. Therefore, we set out on a journey to educate ourselves about the stock market by forming an investment club based on the principles of the National Association of Investment Corporations. Some of our guiding principles included wanting to be disciplined and intentional by making informed decisions based on data 
rather than emotion once we learned about investing. Further, we knew that we wanted to break the cycle of unfamiliarity with the stock market. So we created a second generation program to teach our children and children in our communities about financial literacy. Lastly, we knew that it was essential to follow the adage, lift as you climb. So we embarked on sharing our newfound knowledge and success by being featured in books and magazine articles, such as Black Enterprise Magazine, and hosting events like this, particularly during Financial Literacy Month. Today, our focus is on building wealth through home ownership, and we hope the information shared by our panelists of experts will increase your knowledge and confidence to take action towards wealth building for yourself, future generations, and your community. Remember, lift as you climb. Next, Robin Pope Moss will bring greetings from the Richmond chapter of Urban Financial Services. You're on mute, Robin. Got, sorry about that. Um, thank you, Jackie. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again to the Closing the Wealth Gap Home Ownership Program. My name is Robin Pope Moss, and I am the SVP of Community Engagement and Outreach for the Mortgage Division here at Truist. And I'm the Vice President of the Richmond Chapter of the Urban Financial Services Coalition. UFCS vision is to ensure the full and equitable participation of people of color of all levels in the financial services industry. And I love that vision because I've been a part of, of Urban Financial Services Coalition for now over, I think about seven years. And I wanna encourage you, if you're interested in being a part of Urban Financial to contact any of us um, on the screen that are connected with the coalition, with UFSC. In the past, the Richmond chapter um, would celebrate Financial Education Month in person with an event that we called Food and Finance. Unfortunately, tonight we can't be together, but we're here to engage you and to educate you with information that will help you or someone in your life with their finances. Home ownership is key to building wealth. And I want to share a personal example with you. My father-in-law came to Richmond in the early 60s. Um, he had a sixth grade education. He purchased a home um, and moved into that home with his family. And they lived in that home, he and my mother-in-law, for 50 years. He empowered his four sons to all purchase homes. And with that being said, they were all able and are creating um, family generational wealth. Our goal tonight is to provide you with nuggets that you can use and share with others. Thank you for your time and enjoy the program. D2. Thank you so much, Robin, for that wonderful intro introduction and opening remarks. And Dr. Smith Mason, Jacqueline Smith Mason, thank you so much for bringing those remarks. Let's give them a big round of applause in the chat for their amazing ability to share their thoughts with all of us. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, two ladies that are very dear to my heart. These two ladies have had a significant impact on the Richmond community, on Urban Financial Services Coalition, and Investors 2000 Plus. These are power players in the Metro Richmond area. And I would, like, I would dare say they are power players in the state of Virginia. And they will be moderating our discussion tonight. And the first of those individuals is Ms. Adrian Whitaker. Ms. Adrian Whitaker, is the DEI Director of Virginia Housing and co-founder of the L2L Leadership Institute. Ms. Whitaker has experience in sales and marketing and community relations, as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion in various leadership roles working in the public, private, 
and nonprofit sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause to Miss Adrienne Whitaker. All right, all right. And the next young lady that we that will be monitoring, moderating uh, this powerful session is Melanie Lee Esquire. And she is the owner of Lee Law Office. And she's also the co-author of Essentials to Planning Your Legacy book. Melanie Lee uh, concentrates her practice in the areas of trust and estates, estate administration and business law. She received her law degree from Washington and Lee, and she has, she has deep experience in the field of law and estate planning. And she is a member of the American Academy of Estate Planners and the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. Her firm's philosophy is to help clients create and build and transfer, that's keyword underlying transfer, transfer wealth, which is very important when you're talking about closing the wealth gap. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause for Miss Melanie Lee. You're on mute, Adrian. Got it. D2, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, I know that I appreciate it. I know that my colleague and friend also appreciates it. How about that, uh, Melanie? Absolutely. <laughs> and so tonight, we are so proud to be your co-facilitators um, for tonight's um, program. Both Melanie and I belong to both of the organizations that are presenting tonight, both Urban Financial Services Coalition and Investors 2000 Plus. We have a wonderful panel of speakers, and I'm going to start by introducing two of them before I turn it over to Melanie. So the first person I'm going to introduce is another powerhouse, and it is Monica Jefferson. Monica Jefferson is the Chief Operating Officer for Housing Opportunities Made Equal, also known as HOME. With over 25 years experience in administration, organizational development, mortgage lending, training and facilitation, and human services planning, Monica consults with nonprofit organizations for technical assistance and developing partner and stakeholder relationships. As a seasoned housing professional, Monica has a long history of driving organizational development and managing cross-functional lines of businesses. Monica is an advocate for creating economic and housing opportunities for minorities and low-income individuals. She actively serves on various housing advisory boards. Monica, thank you so much for being part of our panel today. The next person I'm gonna introduce is Marlon White. Marlon is a dedicated to guiding customers through the process of home financing. Whether you are purchasing or refinancing, he is an industry professional with over 17 years of experience in many different areas, including sales, operations, secondary marketing, and Etc. Mr. White is currently a mortgage sales manager and DEI officer for CNF Mortgage Corporation in Melothian, Virginia. Additionally, he attended college at Virginia Commonwealth University, where he majored in marketing. When he is not serving customers, one of his favorite civic roles is serving on the advisory board for Virginia Union University's Department of Workforce Development. Welcome, Marlon. Welcome, thank you for having me. Wonderful. And Melanie, can you introduce our other two friends that we have at the table? 
Absolutely. And great way to say that, Adrian. It is my pleasure to introduce two powerhouse professionals to you all this afternoon, this evening. And I will tell you that I think it's wonderful that I can call both of these wonderful gentlemen friends. So first, I'd like to bring to the stage, as you would say, virtual stage, Kelvin Oliver of Core Mortgage. Kelvin serves as president and originator um, at Core Mortgage. He has, is a mortgage banker with over 20 years experience in the industry. And he's known for bringing ease and orderly, orderliness to the mortgage industry. Kelvin considers his primary objective to work with borrowers, realtors, and title companies in facilitating a smooth closing process. I know everyone appreciates that. Using his analytical technique, identifying capital opportunities, community business, effective networking, multitasking, sales, financial analysis, and business development. After acquiring years of experience in the industry, Kelvin knew he had so much more to offer. So he went into specializing in residential mortgages. And as a regional broker, he founded Core Mortgage LLC, where he currently serves as chief operating officer, overseeing all aspects and facets of the company's operations including but not limited to compliance, origination, processing, marketing, postcode closing, and has all of the relationships to make the process smooth with investors and funds mortgage loans. Thank you, Kelvin, for joining us this evening. I'm also privileged to bring to you the day Max Williams. Max is the CEO and owner of Asset Management Group as well. And so Max actually has in his bio that he hails from Browns Mill, New Jersey. He's a graduate of Rochester Institute in Technology with a BS in Communications and the George Washington University with a master's degree in Human Resource Development. After a short career as an Army I'm sorry, Army Armor Officer. He was stationed in Germany during Operation Desert Shield. He has been active in the real estate industry since 1993, when he purchased his first multifamily building. Throughout his career, Max has worked full-time in various roles related to real estate and investment real estate. Max is a strong advocate for giving back to the community and has worked in leadership capacities to advocate for revitalization groups such as Jackson Ward Neighborhoods in Bloom and various home ownership programs right here in the Richmond, Virginia area. He is a licensed Virginia real estate salesperson with several dis designations, including being a private investor. Max also wants to make sure he has in his bio, he has here that he's a proud active life member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated and has formerly served on the board for Urban League of R Greater Richmond. Max added a, a unique and additional um, qualification to his bio last year when he was voted best realtor in the Metro Richmond area by Richmond Times Dispatch where he was selected over 4,500 licensed realtors. He proudly affiliates with United Real Estate here in Richmond, Virginia. Thank you for joining us, Max. Thank you for having me. Wow, I am so excited. You know, listening to those bios, Melanie, I almost forgot that we are friends with these people. And Absolutely. so we've got a wonderful circle of friends here at our table. And we're going to talk about things that we get to talk about with you all the time. But we're excited that we're going to be able to share it today with the community. So first up, we're going to start with you, Monica. And the question that we have for you is about some of the barriers. So what are some of the barriers to home ownership faced particularly by African-Americans and other people of color? And how can these barriers be addressed? Well, thank you so much, Adrian, for that warm introduction. And I want to welcome everyone to our event uh, this, after, this evening, rather. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, and uh, thank you. Can Monica, you hear me? I can hear you, but Monica, I, I want to say I'm so sorry. 
I actually want you to give opening comments before I ask you that question. Okay. So please continue. Okay. All right. Great. Well, I just wanted to, my grand, I would be remiss if I did not thank people. My grandma would uh, smack me on the hands for being rude. So I just <laughs> wanted to acknowledge uh, the opportunity to be here with you all this evening. And I want to thank the Urban uh, Financial Services Coalition and the Investors uh, 2000 Plus uh, for this opportunity to talk about a topic that's truly near and dear at my heart. And that's home ownership. And I think we all know that the investment of owning a home is one of the top wealth drivers uh, in the, the country and the impact that that has had on families and, and for those to be able to create genera generational wealth. We all know that racism in this country continues to persist and it contributes to the home ownership gap between blacks and whites. And uh, I was looking at some data um, a couple of weeks ago, and I'm sad to say that the home ownership rate gaps that we see for people of color, particularly African Americans compared to whites, are the same rates from 1960. And I think that that's unacceptable when we look at the home ownership rate for whites at 74%, and it's teetering a little bit over 40% uh, for blacks. And um, I am looking forward to having the conversation today to really talk about the challenges and the barriers that continue to impact African Americans. And I hope that at the end of this session today that we can really hopefully come up with some um, marching orders and call to action items that we can do to make an impact in our world and the communities that we serve. And so with that being said, um, Adrian, I think that there are three key barriers um, that uh, impact home ownership that are faced by African-Americans and other people of color. And it has to do with the discriminatory policies of redlining, residential segregation, and the devaluation of assets. And I could go back if I could just do a quick history lesson for us, but the Homeowners Loan Corporation was created back in the early 30s to really help with the refinance of defaulting to prevent foreclosure. Many people have called this corporation the author of redlining. And this is where people of color, majority African-Americans were disproportionately uh, disproportionately uh, marked in red designated areas. And if I had time, I would love to show you the redlining maps of Richmond. The unfortunate thing about those redlining maps, those are the maps where we still see today large concentration of low income people, concentration of our public housing. But these maps were designed to ensure that African-Americans and people of color that did not have access to credit or capital. I think we're continuing to see discriminatory policies today that continue to impact the housing and lending industry. Also the insufficient supply of affordable housing and uh, those individuals who have not been able to have access to wealth to create capital, for most of them, they're still renting. And so it's really challenging for you to be able to access capital um, when you have been shut out of the process. I think the third major issue is um, many um, African-Americans have been hit harder than any other racial group when there is a major financial or economic crisis that impact our uh, country. I could talk about the foreclosure crisis of 2008. I can talk about uh, inflation, redlining, and our latest crisis, which has been the health pandemic of coronavirus 19. And so I think that as we continue to look at how we can leverage the power of home ownership, uh, 
I think that we need to really come up with some strategies and some things of how we can reduce that wealth gap. I wanna share with you all a quote from, uh, and many of you are probably familiar with him. And if not, he's gonna be in Richmond next week, a shameless plug for uh, Holmes uh, Fair Housing Summit. But Dr. Andre Perry, and if I could quote him, we are essentially where we were in the 1960s when the Fair Housing Act was passed. It was supposed to eliminate discrimination and barriers to home buy, but we are still here. And so the policies of the past and the present continues to deliberately prohibit Black people from generating enough wealth to purchase homes. And those who have the wealth, they're scooping up all of the properties. The investors are taking those properties. Those who can pay cash are taking those properties. And it is really limiting the opportunities for first time home buyers to be even to make a dent in this mark. And so we've got to really focus on making some change. I think there is some opportunities and we have a lot of great minds that are on this call tonight that we really need to put our heads together put our coins together and really be intentional about reducing that gap. It had gotten better. I mean, it really in the, you know, early 2000s, uh, you know, the, you know, home ownership was on the move for African-Americans. And so we got to really get back there, but we've got to come up with some really creative and innovative ways for us to be able to do that. And I like to share some of that if, if it's okay, Adrian, if I can kind of move into that section. So I think a couple of things that we really need to do. And I think people don't realize how important this is, but one of the remedies that we can do to really close the gap and address these barriers is that we have got to start with uh, addressing policy issues. The policy issues that continue to um, you know, really eliminate and discredit individuals. It's going on. It's your local policies. That's why it's not only important to vote for the president, but you need to be voting from the PTA all the way to that White House. The, the work that's being done in your counties and your localities and your municipalities is because we're voting people in who do not care or have the same best interests at heart. So we need to stop focusing on policy. We need to start making sure that we're engaging with our board of supervisors, city council, our statewide um, electors, officials as well, to make sure that there are policies in place that will provide uh, changes in our legislating around inclusionary zoning, mixed use, mixed opportunities, whole localities, uh, whole localities, excuse me, I've been talking all day long, uh, whole localities accountable for their fair housing analysis of impediments to make sure that they're ensuring that people have access to housing, access to resource and choice of what they want. I think that jurisdictions need to provide incentives for mixed use, mixed income communities, and we need to strengthen the Home or Mortgage Disclosure Act. In addition to that, we need to really identify developers and those who want to build affordable housing for African-American people. We need to also look at other initiatives and incentives to make it advantageous for people to want to invest in communities. There are cities all across this country where people are making significant investments in historical uh, African-American communities and neighborhoods. And we need to make sure that those things are continuing to happen and advocate for those things. Um, don't just assume that there are so many credit barriers or other opportunities. There are qualified mortgage ready professionals and African-Americans who want to buy homes and create wealth. We just have to be intentional of how we market to them, who we're marketing to them, and creating mortgage lending products that target those individuals, 
creating other resources of investment and philanthropy so that we can continue to invest in these opportunities. It can be done. We just need to be intentional and focus on doing that. And there are specific opportunities that will allow us to do that if we come together. So I know at home, we are the largest provider of uh, direct services of housing, counseling, and education. We provide down payment assistance for those who want to purchase homes in the Richmond MSA. So we're doing our part. And I challenge everyone else out there today to make sure that they do their part. I'll stop right there, Adrian, because I can go on and on. And I want to be respectful of the other participants. <laughs> I am I am appreciative of the food that you are serving to us today. I am appreciative. And I apologize for not giving you the opportunity initially to do that setup. So thank you so much for setting up not just what you had to say, but also setting up the rest of our evening, because we're all going to be addressing um, how can we um, address this gap. So thank you so much, Monica. Melanie? Well, wonderful. I already have a full plate of notes here. Thank you, Monica. Mm -hmm. But it is my pleasure to bring up Kelvin Oliver now to our, our virtual stage. Kelvin, if you could give us an opening statement and then also share with us um, financing options that are available and out there. And I'll make this a two-part. And then how do people know if they're in the right financing option? All right. I appreciate it. Um, so just to piggyback a little bit, I think Monica was very articulate about all of the things that are challenging, particularly the African-American population. So one of the things that I'll speak to are some mortgage products that are available. So some of them are what we've always come to know. So conventional loans, FHA, VA, USDA, which is a program for persons who live in rural areas that would qualify, which they can provide 100% financing. But I'm going to speak to some of the less utilized programs that could be a benefit to uh, clientele. So those are renovation loan programs. So for instance, FHA has a program that's called 203K, where they will provide funds not only to acquire the property, but to also complete uh, repairs on the property. So that's a useful tool, especially in this market where property values have soared so much, it allows a person to maybe get a property at a lower price point and build in the repairs that are needed. So a very important program. There's also a, a renovation product on the conventional side as well that essentially accomplishes the same thing. After 2008 and the mortgage meltdown that everybody is all too familiar with, the term subprime really went away in the mortgage business. And so now there are two classifications. One is QM, which is a qualified mortgage. And then there's non-QM, which in its essence really took the place of subprime. And so what I'm finding is that we're seeing more and more individuals qualify for the non-QM mortgages. These are going to be products such as bank statement programs. So I will tell you in my business, at least every day, at least one time a day, I speak to a self-employed individual who has trouble verifying their income because what happens? When it comes to Uncle Sam, we're trying to show as little income as possible. When it comes to qualifying for a mortgage, it hurts you. And I try to educate people, which is another component, which Monica's organization does a great job of that. Also, Virginia Housing does as well. But quite frankly, we don't have enough education in this space. And so people aren't aware, they're not educated. And so when it gets back to the non-QM programs and I get faced with this, of course, people come to me and they say, well, I'm making the money. And I really educate them and say, if you can't verify it, I can't use it, right? So there are some persons who can use bank statements to verify their income. But see, here's the thing, in order to do that, you're A, going to pay a higher interest rate, and B, you're going to pay a higher down payment. Now, in the new economy where you have so many people leaving traditional workplaces, that can be a tool that can be utilized for persons who are in a financial position to do so. But that's not everybody, but that's a tool that can be used for certain people, okay? In addition to that, we've got commercial loans, you've got fix and flip loans, all of the things that can also contribute to our community starting to build some generational wealth. 
because these are now tools that you can get into after you've acquired your primary residence where you can start the process of gathering investment properties. We also have another relatively new loan program that's caught on quite a bit, and it's called a DSCR program. And that simply stands for Debt Service Coverage Ratio. What it says is if your credit is good enough and you have some money, you can actually acquire a rental property without verifying your income. What they're doing is they're going to look at what the rental, uh, what that property is going to generate in terms of rent. And they're going to compare that with the monthly payment. And that's how you qualify in addition to having good credit and money along with reserves, right? So reserves would be funds that you have access to after you close. Finally, there is a program as well that falls under the Community Development Financial Institution uh, product. And this allows you to actually acquire property with no income or employment verification. But again, it's going to be a higher down payment and it's going to be a higher interest rate. So you have to know what you're dealing with. And so for a lot of self-employed individuals, I tell them, you're going to pay one way or the other. You're either going to pay Uncle Sam or you're going to pay to get that particular mortgage, right? But a lot of it comes down to education and allowing people to know, hey, if I can meet with them early enough in the process, if they're just starting a business, then we can talk them through. These are the things you're going to need. We're going to need two years of tax returns. If you're, let's say, an LLC, we're not going to look at how much money your company generated. We're going to look at your net income. So that means after you write off everything, that bottom line figure, that's what we're using. So someone can come to me and say, well, yeah, you know, I made 120000 last year. But if you wrote off 110000 you're getting credit for $10,000. It's not the same. And so a lot of people just simply aren't educated about that. And then, too, and I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent as far as new businesses, but a lot of people just don't have their paperwork in order. And that's another product of education. And I find that they're so busy trying to make sure that they have a viable business. I get it. But at the same time, you've got to make sure that your paperwork is in order. We're talking tax returns. We're talking P&L statements. All of those things that are going to play a significant part when it comes time to trying to purchase not only your primary residence, but also investment property uh, down the road. So I'll yield back unless you want me to keep going because I can. You did wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Adrian. Thank you so much, Kelvin. Thank you. Marlon, we're going to move over to you now. And so Marlon, um, of course, we want you to have your opening statement. But the other thing too, Marlon, that we want you to talk about, if you could, you know, when you're a first time homeowner or a, 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 a borrower, a big mortgage company can be very, very intimidating. And then you're in this role and then you have this new role of DEI officer. So we would like for you to share your opening statement and then also tell us what are mortgage companies doing to assist um, and, and to attract BIPOC borrowers? Well, thank you, Adrian. I appreciate it. And I want to say thank you to Urban Financial Services Coalition and Investors 2000 as well. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to sit on this panel. And as I'm looking at this esteemed panel and also the esteemed host, I'm like, why am I here? So um, I am excited to be in the role that I'm in. Um, I took a role at CNF Mortgage last year, uh, May will be one year. And at that time, when I took this role, I was an originator. I enjoyed doing what I was doing. I was did a lot of community outreach and um, the education that Kelvin was talking about. I would get out in the community, do first-time home buyers classes, credit seminars, even identity theft. Um, so those were all things that I did, one, just as a service to the community, but then also I did it. Um, it, it was also a way, if I'm being honest, it was a way to potentially draw, draw or drum up new business. 
However, uh, when CNA came, it was an opportunity that this is a part of my role. Um, and that was something I'm like, okay, so I can do mortgage sales, which I've built my career in the last 17 years. But at the same time, now I'm actually having an opportunity with a corporation that says, hey, we're going to support you with the community engagement and outreach and getting out into multicultural markets. So that was a great fit for me. Um, and since I've been doing it, I've had the opportunity to really partner with a lot of community organizations, partner with as well um, a lot of local politicians, uh, HBCUs, uh, some of the various colleges and like your, you know, your Hispanic Student Union, Hispanic Chamber, uh, Metropolitan Business League, and the list goes on. So with that being said, I think to kind of piggyback off of what Monica was saying, I feel that now I'm in a position where I can really affect change. Before it was, I can do some things, I can get people into homes and as I, I can educate them more on a one-on-one -on -one level, but now I'm in a position where I have some resources where I can now partner with community organizations as well and get out into communities and then also provide some sources of funding also. So with that being said, now I feel like I have a position that is allowing me to really bring about some change and partner with institutions and groups to where we can really do some things. Um, I think Monica really kind of gave us all some, some marching orders that it's time for us to really kind of figure out what do we do collectively to really make some things happen. So um, I'm looking forward to continuing that uh, with everyone that's here, not only on the panel, but also people that are just sitting in, because I think we can be the change, we can help bring about the change that we want to see. Um, with all the great minds here, with all the resources here, we can really do these things. Um, now, to address the question as it relates to communities um, and how uh, mortgage companies are trying to meet the needs of BIPOC borrowers. So some of the things that you're seeing is, um, for example, they're hiring people to specifically go after those uh, diverse multicultural markets. So, for example, my company hired me. Um, and that was an area that they realized that they were not strong in, right? So it wasn't, for me, it wasn't just, um, let's just hire somebody that can just go do some home buyer classes because I was already doing that. So my thoughts are, let's go further. What can we do to really partner with uh, some community organizations, find out who the community, community leaders are, figure out where we can bring about the change. And then also, do we have some budget? Do we have some funding where we can partner with an organization so they can continue to do what they're doing, but doing it on a bigger scale and a bigger level because we're providing some funding, right? Also looking at who are our city officials, who are the decision makers, who's on the boards, and how do we partner with them as a financial institution to really say, okay, how do we address the needs in the city? Uh, what can we do? Uh, then, of course, financial education is a huge piece. Uh, we all need that. We need that in various different communities. But then what else can we do? So we started saying, let's can we give special pricing and subsidies for borrowers that are in the BIPOC community so we can make it more affordable for them to purchase a home or give them some subsidies that actually make it to where their rate is more affordable or do things where as they are trying to um, look at loan programs, we can figure out with those loan programs, um, do we offer something portfolio to where maybe they don't fit into your standard conventional or FHA or VA guidelines. So can we do some things portfolio for people in this community or in these communities? Um, next, we're also looking at partnering because on the residential level is one thing, but now can we partner even more with uh, builders that and give them incentives and funding if they have a mission for affordable housing? So trying to identify builders or developers that are willing to say, you know what, in this market, I could build a home and probably sell it for three and 400,000, but I'm okay with getting lower profits to make these homes more affordable so that people who are native to these communities can stay in these communities and the communities don't have to become gentrified. 
Um, so can we, we're looking at how do we partner with uh, developers that are willing to do those things and really have an interest in affordable housing. Let's make their financing easier. Let's give them more access to capital. And then also what we would like to do is make sure that now that you put criteria out there that whoever is buying these houses because they're affordable, that you're not an investor, that you're truly a first time home buyer. And then we can vet that process by doing the financial education, by sending them through Virginia housing, sending them through home to make sure that they can actually, it's someone that's truly a first time home buyer or someone that's truly in the community that has a need. And then we can also give them an incentive to where maybe we'll cover a portion of the closing costs to assist them but now we're trying to make sure that those communities are affordable for the people who are truly there and native to those communities and not just allowing investors to come in, as Monica was saying, and snatch up all the properties and then keep the people in those communities, either forcing them out or making them slave to the landlord and having to rent constantly. Thank you, Marlon. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, before we go to our final panelists um, for this round, I just want to let everyone know that, you know, we've got some great people here. I know that you are beginning to start thinking of some questions. And so we are going to have an opportunity to do Q&A. So if you can start putting your questions into the chat so that we can see what your questions are, and we, um, we're going to have D2 assist us and um, getting those questions to our panel. So if you can start doing that, Melanie, I'm gonna take it over to you so that you can bring up our final speaker. Yes, our final speaker to the virtual stage is Max Williams. Max, if you would give us an opening statement as well, and then if you could talk about things that we should consider when trying to leverage home ownership in real estate. Okay, well, thank you. Uh Attorney Lee, I appreciate that introduction. Um, and thank you to the organizations that sponsor uh, this great event. It's, it's always uh, a pleasure to share information because that education piece, I can't stress it enough, uh, is important. There are a lot of people that I talk to on a daily basis that just don't know. Some of the information is not even easy to understand unless you're in the business. And I'll give you a quick example. We use the term quite a bit, first time home buyer. And of course, for most people, that's somebody that has not owned a home. The caveat behind that, that no one knows about unless you're in the industry is within the last three years. So someone that lost a home in 2008, 2009, 2010, and has been renting ever since is now a first time home buyer when it comes to these programs. Uh, so I have a, a saying that I use quite a bit. You don't know what you don't know. So that is one of the reasons why it's important to talk to professionals in the, in the industry so that you can come up to speed and, and not only use that information for yourself, but also for friends, families, associates. Uh, one of the things that I see uh, quite a bit with uh, first time buyers in particular um, is in a challenging market, not only is there a shortage of affordable housing, but also now the competition level is increased. Uh, there are a lot of buyers and there are a lot of institutions and, uh, of course, investors now that are in the same uh, market. And the disadvantage that a lot of the first time buyers have is that they're up against uh, individuals with cash or with financing that to a seller is much more attractive. Part of the problem or part of the challenge with that is in my own realtor community. Uh, there is a pecking order in financing. I'll give you an example. Let's say five offers come in on a property. One is cash, one is conventional, one is FHA, and one is VA, and the other is, uh, let's say, another conventional. Uh, when that seller goes to look at those, their agent typically is going to school them and let them know that cash is king. A cash offer does not have the ability to fall through because of financing or someone losing a job or not disclosing certain things uh, in their financial past. Uh, below that, conventional is typically less, fewer guidelines as far as uh, potentially a transaction falling through. Uh, FHA, 
is then um, in the next place as far as attractiveness to a seller. And then at the very tail end, uh, VA. VA is very strict when it comes to property condition. And so in the in the realtor community, um, there is a preference. And unfortunately, that hurts a lot of uh, minority borrowers, buyers, uh, and first-time buyers as well. So there are a number of challenges. Part of my uh, role as an agent when I'm representing buyers is to um, help them craft an offer uh, that is attractive, as attractive as possible. And um, some of the things that they can do on their side is uh, you want to start early in this process. Uh, if you know that in two years, three years, you may be thinking about buying, start early. You want to talk to uh, people at the nonprofits. You want to talk to a loan officer. It's not too early to talk to a loan officer, see where you are, see what you need to do. You have time to do so. Uh, so that education piece is huge. That preparation uh, is critical. And then another thing that um, I see, and I'm sure the, the loan officers uh, on the call see, is consumer debt. Consumer debt is one of the things that will kill um, not just a first-time buyer, but many borrowers. Uh, that consumer debt is uh, at a level where it just really hurts their purchasing power and limits what they can do. Uh, by the time you stack on several credit cards, car loans, uh, student loan debt, and other uh, obligations, it really can hurt borrowing power. So you want to get that uh, consumer debt under control and at a level where it doesn't hurt you uh, from a financing standpoint. Um, it is not critical to pay that all off, but that's why you want to talk to the lender to see what's a happy medium between paying that debt down or paying it off and then having, of course, resources for a down payment or closing costs. You still there? I'm still here. Okay. Thanks, Max. Yeah, I think we actually <laughs> muted everyone. <laughs> yes, <laughs> wonderful, Max. <laughs> um, great job, Max. Thank you so much. Um, Melanie, I think we're going to now move to our Q&A. And wonderful. first of all, I want to thank D2, who's also serving in as our technical advisor, and so D2, thank you. I did hear the feedback that we were getting a little earlier. So thank you for muting all lines to get rid of that feedback. So thank you so much. D2, have you been looking into the chat box to see if we have any questions for these very distinguished panelists? Um, yes, I, I've gotten several questions, some in the main chat and, and some directly to me as if I was going to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> But I will give it to the panel. The first question that I um, that I have is in terms of discrimination. This is for the um, for all of the panel. In terms of discrimination, um, these discriminatory discriminating practices like redlining or overpricing <laughs> um, um, people of color. Uh, continue to be consistent, even though they're against the law. What do we do? What do we need to do next to cut down on these? But to to finally eliminate uh, redlining and the overpricing of um, the BIPOC community in terms of home buying. That's open to the panel. Well, D2, I'll oh, go ahead, go ahead, Monica. No, you know, you go ahead, Calvin. Well, one thing, D2, I'm just going to speak to something that's very specific. Um, and I'm going to talk about appraisal issues in particular. And so one of the things that I've found throughout my career is it's not enough. Let's say an appraisal comes in and it doesn't, let's say, hit the mark that we think it should be at in an area um, where our borrower may be a minority. It's not enough to say it's my opinion that it should be higher. You've got to come with some facts, right? And so the key thing is you need to get with mortgage professionals, whether it be your lender, whether it be your realtor, that can go out and get the data that supports the valuation that you think is where it should be. You can't just go to an appraiser and say, hey, well, 
you know, I think my house is worth this. And, you know, because I put new blinds up, et cetera. They're not listening to that. We've got to go and we need to find actual comparable sales that would support the value where it's similar in square footage, it's close in proximity, it's similar in condition, all of those things where you can now make a compelling case as to why you feel your property valuation did not come in where it needs to be. And I can tell you from my end, I've had to do it so many times that I actually have a spreadsheet that I use where I can go through different line items and pull comparable information because it's something that it still happens fairly regularly. But just going back and saying, you know, you're racist, I don't think you like me, you don't like me because I'm a woman, all of those things may very well be true, but they hold no weight without the factual data to, uh, to back them up. So I will just speak to that point and I'll let uh, you know, anyone else chime in where they, where they see fit. I would, yeah, thank you for sharing that, uh, Kelvin, uh, because, you know, one of the, I would say, hot fair housing issues right now is appraisal bias, and that's a ongoing challenge, but we'll save that for another uh, workshop because we can talk about that for a while. But one of the things that I think I want to remind everyone on, and I know that my banking partner friends are here, our financial institutions, so disclaimer, I'm, I'm not talking about you all just doing things in general, that of course that, you know, there is a community reinvestment act that, you know, and it's a law, you know, that is designed to encourage banks to invest in low to moderate neighborhoods and communities of color. And this law and act was passed to start eliminating redlining. And so unfortunately, redlining practices still occur, but we do have a responsibility to make sure that these regulated financial institutions are adhering to the Community Reinvestment Act. And so that's a concern. And as we can see, because many of our financial institution banking centers are leaving our communities of color and putting ATMs there and, and other things. So these are the things that I think that we need to pay attention to, we need to address, and we need to reach out to our financial institutions to, for them to showcase their track record on how they are serving and investing these communities and using data to look at banks' mortgage lending disparity rates to see actually who they're lending to you know, what type of loans are they providing, where those loans are. So those are the things, D2, I think that we can do. Uh, and these are things that uh, continue to be on home's radar to address so that we can once and for all eliminate redlining. Absolutely. Can Thank I share you. something real quick? Yes, go right ahead, Max. Yes. Um, one of the things, one of the tough things about discrimination is it is very hard in many cases to prove, especially when we come to the lending side. A lot of people don't know this because it did not hit the radar of the media like it really should have, but we've got a financial institution right here in Richmond, a household name within the past few years that cut a seven figure check because their numbers just didn't add up as far as their lending practices. OK, and that is right here in Richmond. And we are talking a lot of families, a lot of money. And it's a disgrace that it's still going on. But if you see something that doesn't seem right, home is here to take that information and maybe they can look at it and figure out they have a, a tremendous track record of proving these cases uh, going back quite a while. And so if you see something, especially if you're in the industry, it behooves us to, to talk about it and bring that to the forefront. Thank you, Max, for that shameless plug. <laughs> can, I, can I chime in just a, a second, too, to give a, a slightly different perspective? Let's not get fooled either by some of our counterparts who do not believe that this is an issue at all. And so I hear their thoughts all the time, and their justification is, 
well, how can someone discriminate when we have credit scores, we're just looking at the score? Or why would anybody discriminate? Because we make money when we lend to persons of color too. So don't be fooled as well by some of the prevailing thoughts that are outside of our community. Because I'm telling you, they do not share our same concerns or our same causes. So I just wanted to plug that in. If I can just jump in um, really quickly, and I don't want to belabor the point about appraisals, because like Monica said, we can talk about that. That's a whole seminar by itself. But I want to just throw this little nugget out there. When you are thinking about refinancing or purchasing, talk to your lender, ask them the question, what is your appraisal policy? Uh, what's the process for if your appraisal renegotiation or reconsideration of value? What is your process for that? Most lenders, all lenders have a, a process in place to where if you feel that your appraisal, if your home did not appraise, that there should be a process for reconsideration of value. Now, to Calvin's point, you have to be able to prove that and come with some hard data. However, uh, one of the things, because this is becoming more of an issue, lenders are reevaluating like that process normally has been super confusing and the average consumer wouldn't know what to do. So one of the things that we're having to look at is how do we make this very simple? So if a consumer asks the question, whether the appraisal was spot on or whether it was way off, it should be very clear what your next step should be. And so I would say, always ask your lender that so they can give you those steps. And if they can't give you a clear answer to that question, then you may want to reconsider who you're going to do business with. Because if you have an issue with your appraisal, you don't want your lender saying, well, you know, this is what we think the value is. No, they should be able to give you a clear outline process of if you feel like your value was off, this is what our next steps are. Here's what we can do. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, D2, I do think we have time for another question. Um, I can't believe how this time is just getting away from us because it's just been yes. so good. <laughs> Wonderful information. Absolutely. So here's the um, next question. Um, so this is uh, from Janae Roscoe said Operation Hope is opening at Hope um, Richmond um, inside. And her question is, do any of the mortgage corporations have a down payment, down payment program that offers down payment assistance for first time home buyers? And also do mortgage corporations provide budget support and understanding for first time homeowners, homeowners that might have student loan debt um, coming out as high student loan debt coming out as recent college students? I love that question. And I know all of you are chomping at the bits, at least I hope you are, to please answer that question. So who wants to take that question first? Those questions first, please. I, I would like to. Thank you. Although I'm not a lender, I'm very well versed in these programs. Um, and there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one is all lenders are not created equal. So you have some institutions that have access to certain funds that other institutions don't have access to. Uh, that me doesn't mean that they won't have any. It just means it may be a different pot of funds. Um, secondly, you, wanna, you want to handpick you want to handpick your loan officer. Your loan officer is one of the most important people in your process, and this is why. If you just decide, oh, I'm just going to go to the bank I do no normal business with, and I'm going to sit down with the, the person that is handling mortgages at that branch for the day, you don't know who you're going to get. You don't know their level of experience. You don't know if they are well-versed in first-time buyer programs. You don't know if they are versed in grant programs. Whereas if you handpick your loan officer, someone that has been in the business that knows these programs inside and out, that's going to put you at an automatic advantage. There are even loan officers in town that will actually do the paperwork for you, as opposed to just sending you off to a nonprofit for you to kind of do it yourself. 
So all of those things are crucial. It is not a loan officer's responsibility to find you grant money or to do some of these programs. A lot of them will do it as an added service, but it's not their responsibility. So going in with that knowledge, it's important. And, and whatever you do, you definitely want to concentrate on a local lender that has a local reputation. Our programs right here in Richmond for first-time homebuyer assistance are sometimes specific to neighborhoods. And I didn't know this till a few years ago. We have grant money that is specific in some cases to actually certain blocks in certain neighborhoods. That's how specific it gets. Joe Smith at joesmithmortgage.com, it's based out of Utah, has no clue what's available here in Richmond or these programs. So it's important to deal with someone right here that is knowledgeable and can get you the best transaction possible from a loan and a grant program, uh, uh, assistance program, uh, theoretically, someone can combine 100% financing, we've got it right here in the state, with money to help with closing costs. And it's possible to get into a home, and I've done it before, and I'm sure uh, the gentlemen on the call have done it before, for less money than it would cost for first month rent and security deposit. And that blows some people away, but you can combine programs. You can piggyback some of these programs in order to get the most benefit for you um, that, that you're entitled to. One last thing, this money does come and go. So it's not this endless pot of funds. Some of these programs will run out, but then there'll be another one that will be in place. I've never had a situation in 11 years of working with first-time buyers where there was no money available anywhere for uh, assistance. So it's important to keep all of those things in mind in order to maximize your situation. I, I understand we only have 11 minutes left. So um, thank you guys, UFSC, as always, for doing this. We are coming through Truist um, to Richmond. We're hiring right now. And um, I'm really excited to first, whoever our, our employee will be, to have them join UFSC Richmond. <laughs> and then secondarily, um, the mortgage companies and the entities, housing programs that, that were presented today, I want to make sure that I send that to our representative because what we do is have referral alliances so that as we are a HUD approved housing counseling entity, we also like to work with UFSC if there are mortgage companies that we can make referrals to so that after we've done the official housing counseling work, we have a trusted network of mortgage companies and entities to be able to coordinate um, them to, to learn about you all's products and services that can help them get into a home in the metropolitan Richmond and Petersburg um, area. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Janae. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the questions. Um, before we go to our closeout, I know that there was two parts to that question. I know we have a couple of lenders, of course, Monica, I know that you know all about all the various programs that are out there. Um, does anyone else want to address any um, the question about first-time homeowner um, programs, grant down, down payment assistance programs, and or programs for students or graduating students with loan debt? I'll jump in and just address as it relates to student loans. So it goes back to what Max was saying, where you want to handpick your loan officer and make sure, I always say, in, interview your loan officer, interview your lender, ask them the questions that you feel are important. So if you know you have student loans, interview them first before you allow them to pull your credit, ask them the question, are you well-versed in programs uh, for someone that has student loan debt? Are you well-versed with first-time homebuyer programs? Are you well-versed with grant programs and local grant programs? So each of your kind of major investors, so whether it's a VA loan, an FHA loan, conventional loan, they all kind of look at student loans a little bit differently, right? So there are some wiggle room sometimes in there, but it just depends on what loan we're trying to qualify you for. And I'm sure Kelvin can speak to this. Sometimes if you have student loans, we adjust the type of loan that we're trying to get you qualified for because one may be a little bit friendlier to your debt ratio so where we don't have to count all the student loan debt, the full payment, only a percentage of the payment. 
Uh, some will just allow us to use, uh, if you're in an income-based repayment plan and you're only paying $100 a month, we can use that. But we have to know what those guidelines are so then we can direct you. Um, so for example, today I was dealing with someone that I was working on getting them qualified and they, they had student loans that were taking my debt to income ratios too high. So one of the local Virginia housing programs, they wouldn't qualify for. Fortunately, I knew that if I changed them to a similar product, I would only have to count a, le a less portion of that total balance, which then allowed them to qualify. So ask the questions of your loan officer to find out what things do they know, what things do they specialize in. And if you can Google search and your loan officer can't give you more information than what you just Google, then you might want to keep it moving. Thank you, Marlon. And, and Adrian, if I could just add one thing, mm -hmm. and uh, I know that Marlon just mentioned it, but we're very fortunate enough here in the Commonwealth to have one of the top state financing agencies in the country, and that's Virginia Housing. Uh, and so they offer an array of uh, first time home buyer loans, the government. Uh, they also have uh, down payment assistance and state of the art education. So I encourage before you do anything, get educated how to be a better informed consumer and understand the process of purchasing a home before you start down this road of investment. So just wanted to share that. Thanks a lot, Monica. And I am going to accept that shameless plug and say that when it comes to our down payment assistant programs and our other programs, that if you want to know more about our programs, if you want to get connected with our programs, you can always go to a mortgage provider such as Marlin, such as Kelvin, or a realtor such as Max, and they can direct you to our programs. And then also we do have our first time homeowner um, homeowner. Um, workshops and happy to say in person again. So with that said, we're down to our final five minutes. And so I'm going to say, Melanie, I think we have enough time for everyone to give their final comment. If we do what D2 does, you know, we give them a, yes. a second. So Melanie, how many seconds you want to give them? I would say we can do 1.2 1. 1. 2 minutes. How about that one? 1.2 minutes for them yeah. all to share because we only got five minutes left. Yeah, that for all our panelists, it'll take us to a 30 second wrap up. 30 second wrap up for each of you. That's yeah. fair with me. Who wants to go first? Let's let's start how we started. Monica, why don't you go first? Yes. So again, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here with you on this evening to see so many familiar faces that I have known throughout the industry. This has been great dialogue today and I'm so glad to be a part of this panel. I would just say to those who are participating today that home ownership is the gift that keeps on giving. And if you are eligible, I highly recommend that you pursue home ownership as one of those tools, one of those vehicles to not only create wealth for you and your family, but also the generations to come. Uh, we've talked about a lot of resources and tools and opportunities, barriers and opportunities, but hear me when I say that this will allow you to do so many things. I put my children through college with the equity in my home. And so this is something that I encourage everyone to take advantage of and be an investor as well. After you get that first house, then go ahead and transition to investment and help someone get started. Don't let them rent in your house forever, but let them get started and help them continue to become a homeowner. So let's change the dynamics. Let's change the trajectory of the Black wealth homeownership gap and help African-Americans become homeowners. Thank you, Monica. I think next after Monica, Melanie, who was after Monica for final after, comments? Right, for after, so after Monica, we have Kelvin. Um, so again, uh, grateful to be here. It's uh, reassuring to know everybody on the panel. Everybody's been around for a while. I like to think that we're not getting older, but we're getting better. And when it comes to home ownership, I mean, truly, it's the foundation of any wealth in this country. And we need to encourage it as much as possible. And I think the key thing is we need to educate. 
not only in our household, but our extended family, our community, our friends, et cetera, and share the knowledge that we have. Um, I think it's just extremely important. Like Monica was saying, it's how she put her kids through college. It provides you with options. And any time in life you have options, it beats the opposite. So whether it's putting children through school, starting a business, doing renovations, whatever the case may be, that home ownership will start you off on your path to being able to do some of the things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Also, remember the tax laws. Landowners made the tax laws. You're a homeowner. That means you're now a landowner. You want to get on that side of the fence, right? Because the tax laws are skewed in your favor. And so I would just leave with that and say, again, just try to educate your circle and your sphere of influence. And let's keep this ball moving. Thanks a lot, Kelvin. Marlon, you have your 30 sec 30 second wrap up. Thank you. I just want to say thanks again for having me and just let me be on this esteemed panel. And I will end and wrap up with this. Our community, our dollar is powerful. So let's support those that support us. So if they are financial institutions and they are not supporting our community and we can't show, and especially if we clearly can see that they are discriminating against our community, they should not be getting our dollars. And this is from someone who works for a financial institution. If you can't go to your financial institution and feel valued and feel that your community is valued, then it's time for us to stop putting our dollars places where we're not being valued. Because guarantee you the reason why that companies are realizing now that they have to support BIPOC communities and do more, even though we still have discrimination, is because they realize with the browning of America that your largest opportunity in the future, if you still want to be relevant, this is the community that you're going to have to deal with. And so if you're not supporting them now, 20 years from now, and they're not supporting you, then you're not going to be in business. You're not going to be relevant. You're not going to be profitable. So what gets past a lot of the issues when it comes with race is green, the dollar. So if we control where our dollars are going, then we can get these institutions to actually invest in us, treat us fairly, or you don't get our business. And I'll end with that. Thanks a lot, Marlon. And Max, before we turn it over to our chapter president for the final word, we'll give you your Let's see, do we even have 30 seconds left for you, Max? We might. <laughs> You're on mute, Max. Oh, I'm glad I was because I had some inappropriate words I just said. <laughs> okay, so every community in the country has 65, 75, 85-year-old people that are living in a home. They may have four or $5,000 in the bank. That may be their net worth, with the exception 30 years ago, they decided to buy a house. Today, that house is worth two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. And that was money that was basically paid to live someplace. And now it's equity. It's money they can use to continue their life, to pass on to their, uh, their heirs. It just gives them choices. And it was like a forced savings account. Let me flip it around a different way. A $300,000 house, if we have 5% appreciation per year, some years are going to be much more. Some years might be a little bit less. 5% appreciation on a $300,000 house is $1,250 per month. Okay. So you, the house that you are living in, if you own it, it's worth $300,000. Every month it's going up in value $1,250. That's a powerful investment. That's not even including the tax benefit that uh, Kelvin hit on earlier. And more importantly, that payment today, that payment to the bank, that principal and interest payment today is going to be the same payment that you make in year number 30 as it is year number one. So of course, it's going to feel real easy at year number 10, 15, 20, if that payment is fixed. Real estate is a powerful investment. If you have the ability to buy, buy once you own own some more. Have Thank a great you a lot, Max. Thank you so much. And with that, we're going to turn. First of all, thank you to all of you. It was powerful, powerful, powerful. Yeah. I am now going to, on behalf of myself and my partner, Melanie, 
We're going to turn the program over to Daryl Tyler, the president of the Richmond chapter of Urban Financial Services Coalition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. And thank you everyone for attending. I, we're, we're behind the time. So I'm all, all of my 15 pages of speeches, I've got to blow, blow out the window right now. And I just got to say thank you to, every, to all of the guests for all of your invaluable and timely insight. Uh, thank you, uh, Monica. You, 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 were start, you were actually talking about some of the stuff I did in graduate school and, and measuring bank flight. Um, and I want to thank all of the guests here. And uh, one of the things I want to leave with is that the number of attendants here just says speaks volumes. I think we were somewhere scratching at 40 and I know we're past the time. So we've had some people come out and I want uh, the people here to the guests here to leave with a couple of things. One, I hope you've all enjoyed and take with you some of these invaluable nuggets. I know having to refinance last year and sit on the board of a credit union that's now opening up mortgages uh, for this calendar year is a big thing. And I, I'm glad this is being recorded. Secondly, um, for all of the attendees today, I hope you leave with another connection. Uh, everyone has put their LinkedIn in, in the chat. I hope you've copied it into your notepad and everything. And when you get an opportunity, connect with the LinkedIn chats and just keep it going so we can all rise at once. And lastly, I, I can't leave without saying the Urban Financial Service Coalition is out there. I've put our link out there. Richmond Chapter is always looking for new members, always looking to renew members. We have a three a three tiered mandate is to emp economically empower our members, to educate our members, and to promote professional development. Uh, that's what we do, as uh, reflected of this evening. And I know my time is going, so I apologize for talking fast, but I don't want to keep anyone too long. I wish you all a fantastic evening. Uh, D two, this is fantastic. I love it. I'm so happy you're recording this because I want to show it. I want to share it with some people at the credit union. Once again, good night, everyone, and have a safe and blessed evening.